I sex you up. <laughs> sex you up. All right. Well, that was a little abrupt. <laughs> you know, uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, In the Green Room with Katja Reicherman. And I, am I saying it right? I, I'm saying, do I pronounce your name right, Katja? Yeah, Katja is fine. That's perfect. Okay. All right. So I got to tell you, um, uh, we were talking a little bit ahead of time. I'm a little nervous, you know, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, I briefly, uh, we've met only once. Um, we've had a couple of text exchanges over the years and I know, you know, mutual friends and, um, uh, that because I was looking on your website before we went live with this and I'm reading things about you, I'm going, Whoa. So I, I get a little nervous and, and I, I'm going to fan out for a few minutes and be such a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's uh but let me just start with uh you're from germany and and how did you get your start in music in germany uh i started playing when i was 21 actually which is quite late uh, i never played an instrument before that <clears throat> and but i i, I didn't want to play in music before but my parents weren't too keen about that so um, so I didn't start playing until I had moved out and had my, you know, was my own person and was able to make my own decisions. It, when, when you started playing in Germany, what, what gave you the idea or what inspired you to play, pick up the saxophone and start playing? Well, uh, when I was like, I think I was like 12 years old, <clears throat> you know, um, David Sanborn was the saxophone player that really played on everything that we all listened to at the time, like all the pop stuff and all the soul stuff and the cool stuff. And then also Michael Brecker. And whenever I heard the saxophone, I was like, wow, it's like such a cool instrument. I love the saxophone. So, and then, um, but for some reason, because my parents didn't, didn't want me to make music, um, then I saw Al Jarreau, I believe I was 17 uh, in Hamburg and David Sandman was playing with him. And I was like, oh my God, I really want to play the saxophone, but I still couldn't do it, so. And, and so you moved out on your own and, and you, you picked up a sax and did you take lessons? Did you just, start playing by ear what, what? no i took lessons i i had to tell i took private lessons you know um because i didn't know anything I, I couldn't read music nothing so I, I i bought a book you know to in order to read music and i had to kind of like count the little things you know how you start to read music it's like right. and then i looked up the finger at the fingering chart i'm like oh that's supposed to be a c all right and the c is like that of course you know that's how we all start Right. So, so, but I did that when I was 21. When, when you were 21. And, and you're right. That seems to be uh, pretty late for most people, but you dove right into it. And then, uh, what was, how long before you did your first gig? <clears throat> I started playing in a band called Tetere, which was a whole bunch of uh, crazy musicians. It was kind of like a, um, like a marching band. But, uh, you know, because marching bands aren't very popular in Germany, but this was a um, like a very chaotic marching band. Everybody was dressed in red and black, and we would play arrangements of like you know Beatles songs and uh, I don't know like Rolling Stones tunes and stuff like that. So cool right. stuff. And then we would just it'd be crazy and you know when like walk around. It was thirty of us. So, and I started playing in that band when I was 22. So I'd only been playing for a year. And that band was um, a combination of super professional, like high level musicians and people like me who could barely play. So, so this, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting a picture of, uh, you know, I grew up in Nebraska in the Midwest, which might as well be Germany or some other country. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, to when I grew up, I could not be farther away from the music that I was listening to and wanted to play. You mentioned Al Jarreau and David Sanborn. And that was, you know, who didn't like Al Jarreau, who was a musician, right? 
So I always had this idea of, you know, I want to get to California because that's where everything is. That's where the music is. Did you have any, as you learned to play the sax and did all of that, did, did you start thinking that way? No, not at all. But for some reason, my inner voice told me that um, I'm going to be playing with a big star one day. <laughs> I don't know. It was like it was like the inner voice that kept saying, "You keep doing what you're doing," because you know a lot of my friends were were. I mean, they were supportive, but they all of them told me, "You know what? You're wasting your time. You're way too old to start playing an instrument. You're never gonna make it." Uh, you know, and I, I and I spent most of my time when everybody else was going to party. You know, I would practice. Mm -hmm because I had a lot of catching up to do. But yeah, it was kind of like this inner voice that told me to keep going. Well, you know, I, I, I'm really glad that you did because we're going to get to your story because this, this is good. If anybody young or who has an aspiration to play music or something, this would be a good story because uh, not only did you start later and people are saying, don't do this, but did you experience any of this, oh, you're a girl, can you make it because you're a girl kind of thing in the music over there? Uh, yeah, that too. Um, but I think it was more, a little bit more the other way around where, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, like once I kind of like got a little better and I, I knew a little bit more what I was doing, um, I felt that people were telling me, oh, you sound good for a girl. Mm -hmm. yeah. what I mean? So it's a little bit like, yeah, yeah, you sound good for a girl. See? So it's like, so it's like, you can't really sound good when you're a girl. Like that's, that's, that's the thing behind that. You know what I mean? Right. It, it, because so, so, so I tried to, um, there was a time where I was, where I was really annoyed about that and where I, um, where I tried to not even look that good, you know? I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna go like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like have like hair, like crazy hair and I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that didn't last very long. You know, then I, then I realized, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try to use this to my advantage. Right. And, and the, the better you got, eventually people just started recognizing you for your musicianship rather than, and, and not even saying anything for a girl. Because I, when, when I was a kid, I mean, honestly, and I'm 61, so like 40 years ago, and, and, and see that would, you know, in the, the 60s, 70s, there was that stigma on, on girls and women. It was like, um, oh, Oh yeah, for a girl, like you said, for a girl, she's pretty good, you know? Uh, and the, the girls in the band were always just singers, you know, because, you know, women just weren't known as good instrumentation, you know, as horn players or bass or any rhythm, but that's changed a lot. And, uh, and because as you went on, then how did you end up leaving Germany? I left Germany in 97 mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't even plan on leaving Germany. I just came here to visit my brother who was already living in Los Angeles. Mm. And I was just going through a hard time in Germany. Um, I went, had just gone through a breakup <clears throat> with my boyfriend at the time that I was living with for a couple of years and we had just broken up. And then at that time also, um, I mean, I'm, I was basically a professional musician at the time already, meaning that I would, you know, pay my bills making music. Mm -hmm. I was actually teaching at a couple of schools and um, I was still playing with that same band that I started out with. Um, uh, but that was musically, it wasn't very challenging to me. And I kind of like was looking for more challenges, you know? So anyway, so I came here to visit my brother uh, just to get away from uh, from everything in Germany. And then he took me to the baked potato, 
which we all know. Mm -hmm. And there was this jam session going on that I don't know if you ever went there, uh, the screaming cocktail hour with Teddy Andreades, a uh, keyboard player that used to play with Guns N' Roses. <clears throat> and it was a super, super fun jam session where everybody used to go, you know, like all the, all the total guys, all, you know, all the rock stars. I mean, this was like at the end of the 90s. Right. So, and uh, it was a jam session, so you, you were able to uh, sit in and my brother introduced me to Teddy and then, you know, of course, first Teddy looked up and down at me. He was like, really, you wanna play? I was like, I'll see, see what you got. And, um, but then uh, I played and, and so, so they were cool, you know, they said, yeah, you can come back anytime. So I went there like, um, like I think I was here for two weeks and I went there like twice and when it was time to go back to Germany I thought to myself well why do I even want to go back to Germany I mean there's nothing there that I'm looking forward to right now why don't I just move here my brother lives here so I decided from one day to the other that I was going to move here so I went back home <clears throat> sold everything I owned like everything, sold my car, gave away my furniture, <clears throat> the little that I had. Of course, I didn't have that much because, you know, I was still like a starving musician, so to say. <laughs> but, uh, and then a month later, I came here and I stayed. And so you'd already made the connection in uh, at the baked potato with some people. When you got here, um, what was it like when you got here and trying to network with people and, and get gigs? Because it can be daunting for somebody to come to Los Angeles <clears throat> and just go, I'm, I'm going for it. That was very hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so what I had to do basically, um, all right, well, I met a couple of people there at the baked potato, but you know, that's not enough. So because I didn't really know anybody else, what I had to do is, um find other clubs around town that had live music and at the time in the 90s if you remember it was different there was so much more live music everywhere i mean every restaurant had like a little section and they were like all oh, these amazing soul funk blues bands jazz bands playing some with some celebrities like jeff goldblum who we can talk about in a, in a minute as well um so i uh you know, LA Weekly was my Bible basically. So I, if you remember LA Weekly, so I used to go and study, you know, which club had live music. And then I just went me on my saxophone by myself, listen to, to the band. And then eventually I would walk up to the band and say, hey, um, I just moved here from Germany. Do you mind, can I sit in with you guys? So, and that's how I networked for like, I guess two years at least, almost oh. every night. So, so you network, but now I, I'm also reading here a, a little bit on your biography. Not, not only did you uh, start working as a musician, but you started doing some film and TV things. How, how did, how did that, it, was that through music or just? Yeah, you... that was, I was doing sidelining jobs. That, that was through the union because people told me, yeah, you should join the union, which I did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have this referral service. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I got the Star Trek Nemesis thing. And then Ali McBeal. I was a regular in Ali McBeal whenever they had the band there. But, uh, I mean, I, I'm still a member of the union. And I haven't really, sorry to say this, if anybody from the union is listening, but I haven't gotten any other job ever since. So it's like. Mm -hmm. from through the union i don't know i mean i'm still paying my my membership uh stuff but i haven't gotten any other gigs through the union since then yeah i my my experience with the union and uh, unfortunately in the work that i had always done as one of the quote unquote gigging musicians <laughs> um the union was non-existent really you know when you go out and you're doing casuals that we call them when you're playing in in weddings or clubs or <clears throat> parties and stuff the union doesn't really have anything to do with those gigs and they 
Um, so I've never even, I, I let my membership go and never bothered. It seems like they're pretty strong in the, in the film and TV industry though, in the recording industry. On the movie. Yeah, probably. I guess if you record a lot of movie stuff, you know, like that's great. Mm -hmm. I also, I had to be a member of the union for all those years when I was with Rod Stewart, which was 14, which was 14 years. Well, hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold huh? on. I want to get. I want to get to that. I'm building to that point. Hold on. Yeah, hold on one second. So I just want to say because I had to do a lot of TV performances with them. And when you, whenever do you do TV performances, then you know the union is involved because right. they. So, I, I guess you have to be a member. Like if you do like, you know, back then David Letterman, Jay Leno, or whatever you know, right? Whatever they do, whatever they, you, whatever they are. Did you have to be uh, have a snag a card to do those, or was it just musicians union? I don't even know. snag card. What is that? Sag is for like a. Oh, stupid. sag, sag. Yeah. I thought you yeah. said snake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like snake card. Yeah, you gotta get sneaky and. Uh... I'm like, <clears throat> you know, it's it's funny. I have I have somebody that's renting a guest house here. Uh huh. Uh, his name is Christian. He has a little snake. Really. It's like a small, and he, he wears it around his neck sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, you've got a big snake around your neck. Oh. But it seems very sweet, that snake. So, so uh, now th th there's, there's four years here. So you moved here in 97. You're here <laughs> for four years. You do the couple of TV shows. Um, you did uh, it, and you uh, then all of it, all of a sudden, this thing comes up with Rod Stewart. And and I'm jumping back to when you first said your dream was to be on a stage or be performing with some big star or doing something. Now, all of a sudden, you get this gig with Rod Stewart. I mean, what what, what was that like? <laughs> I mean, <come> <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, I must say that um, I was actually ready to give up. Because I had I had been paying my dues, I had done all the work, I had gone out and networked a lot, and not much had come around from that. You know, I I had a couple of gigs here and there, but they didn't pay much. You know, it was really super hard for me to to make enough money to to support myself, and I was I was kind of depressed. So I was I was actually almost ready to move back to Germany and give up and mm. say say you know what this is not for me. I I just I did all this work. I just, you know, I'm struggling too much. So I, you know, isn't there a saying that you have to be like really, really on the bottom, you know, like, so you have to be as little as you fit underneath the carpet. That's when your break comes. And that's what happened to me really. Well, it, yeah, it sort of, it, it, sometimes it almost feels like uh, we're in a, in a state of surrender. Okay. Whatever. I just give up kind of thing. Uh, that happened to me. Uh, so it, it, was it kind of like that? You were just ready to just give up a little bit? And... Oh yeah, totally, a hundred percent. And even when I when I went into the audition, I was like, I didn't care anymore if I was gonna get the gig. I, I went in there and I, I I figured, you know, I'm not gonna get it anyway. So I went in there, um, just wearing jeans, a tank top baseball hat and sneakers you know i didn't dress up at all it was kind of like it was like yeah hey what's up <laughs> and and then surprised me i got that gig so it was like, really oh uh, and it changed my life completely you know yeah and and so you did that for 14 years yeah and uh i well i can't even uh, you know my kids uh i have kids and i have a, a 14 year old who doesn't even know who Rod Stewart is, right? And and so those of us who do, though, I mean, there was a time when there was nobody bigger than Rod Stewart. I mean, he was giant, and not that he's he still isn't, but but it, when he like, uh, do you think I'm sexy? Which I, I kind of want to play that thing that you did. Yeah, please do that. To do that, and by the way, while I'm getting that up, I want you to know that your friend uh, Lori Cook has tuned in. Oh, cool! <laughs> and she's Hi, Lori, and and she, her husband Stuart. They they've been very nice. I've been emailing with those guys. I don't know them personally, but they are very very nice people. So hi, is that the only two people that are watching? 
no there's more but they're the ones that commented oh yeah. cool yeah so um so i'm going to pull this up and it takes me a minute um to turn the, the screen on and uh and then i'll play that because it's really cool because you got rod stewart to uh did he sing on it or did you use his voice he did yeah he re-recorded vocals for me on that. oh that's cool okay so you know you're black now oh oh yeah because okay, i'm that's a different that's a different video though <laughs> yeah so you're gonna uh it's because i'm getting ready to play this uh do you think i'm sexy thing and i have to go here and do this Suggestions. He's so nervous about an hour of questions. His lips are dry, his heart's gently pounding. Don't you just know exactly what he's thinking? Hey, you want my body? Hey, you think I'm sexy? Come on, sugar, tell me so. Oh, yeah. If you don't really mean it, just reach out and touch me. Come on, honey, tell me so. Oh, yeah. She's acting shy, looking for an answer. Come on, honey, let's spend the night together. Now hold on a minute before we go much further. Give me a time so I can go my mother. If you want my body, and you think I'm sexy, come on, sugar, tell me so. Yeah, if you really need me, just reach out and touch me. Come on, honey, tell me so. All right. All right. His heart's beating like a drum Cause at last he's got this girl home Relax baby, now we are alone They wake at dawn, all the birds are singing, two total strangers, that ain't what they're thinking, outside it's cold, misty and it's raining, they got each other, neither one's complaining, hey, you want my body, hey, you think I'm sexy, come on, should it tell me so, hey, you really need me, just Come on, honey, tell me so. All right, so uh, you know what I really liked. 
uh, on that, especially at the end when we got to see you behind the stage and doing all that kind of fun stuff. <laughs> with all the music. <laughs> so, uh, so Rod came in and sang, uh, re-sang that track for you. Yeah. Well, he yeah. did it. He did it uh, from his house, from his studio. Yeah. No, but you know what? Uh, everybody just does their home thing these days, especially people that got, you know, the nice studios. He, have you seen his studio or anything? Yeah, he yeah. he um, he sets it up in his living room usually when when he's working on a new record. Um, oh. That's where he records vocals sometimes. Okay, so um, now uh, a after that gig, then uh, and you did that for fourteen years. So uh, what'd you do after that? Well, it's being challenging to be honest with you, because you know having a gig like that is. Uh, is a blessing in the sky because you make really good money you get to travel the world and then all of a sudden you know the big paycheck is not there anymore so that that was a really challenging part to figure out um the financial aspect of it but um i started practicing a lot more a lot more than what i did when i was on tour with rod I don't know if you've done big tours like that. It's hard to actually practice when you're on tour like that. Yeah. Especially yeah. At, when, when you tour that much that we did, you know, because you travel and then you, you know, you're sleep deprived and then you got to be at sound check and then you got to get ready for the gig. And then, so the days are very long and there's not that much time to actually really practice and work on, on uh, becoming a better musician. So, yeah. That's what I did. Uh, that's what I have been doing in the last, I think it's been five years already. So, and I feel, I feel like a, <clears throat> a lot stronger and better player now than I, than I was when I was actually playing with a big star, <laughs> you know? You know, well, I don't know if, um, and that's why I, I think doing things like this and having conversations, it's like, um, uh, talking about the things that we do as musicians and, and the, the touring and everything, regular folks like friends of mine where I grew up have no idea. All they see is when you're on stage, but it's all of the when you're not on stage stuff that can really, really burn a person out. They don't realize what goes into the a tour where, you know, you go from a car to a bus to a hotel and to a bus and a car and on a stage and and you're you're not eating right and and it it can be really grueling even when you're taken care of well you know i mean you're you're just always traveling in and out of the suitcase and yeah. uh, so there really isn't time and i know from my from my times i remember there you know i my very first gig on a cruise ship which we had had a lot of time and but my whole purpose was I want to take a cruise ship gig because I'm going to have lots of time to practice. So instead of having lots of time to practice, I just found lots of time to party. <laughs> so it was just the You found what? You found what, sorry? I found lots of time to party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, that happened. I guess uh, that happened with me as well. You know, on days off, instead of practicing, you kind of like find the crew guys that are hanging out at a bar, you know, right. and and then whatever, a couple of hours later and, you know, five or six beers and a couple right. of Jamesons and you're like, oh, God, no more practicing today. <laughs> Um, so, so you, you came back now, you've actually, uh, fr from what I can tell, you've worked yourself into a, a pretty nice little circuit of people. You, you are, you have your own band. Don't you play at the baked potato with your own group now? Oh uh, yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I've through those whole years, I've always, um, been writing music and I've always had a band, even though uh, in the, during the time when I was with Rob, I didn't perform with my own band that much um, because it was hard with everybody's schedules and stuff. And, and most of my band members um, were also, you know, successful touring musicians and very busy. Right. 
But yeah, in the last five years, because especially I released uh, my latest record called Never Stand Still, um, which is my baby. I'm very proud of it um, because it's like 70s inspired soul, funk soul um, that I wrote and arranged uh, everything uh, along with uh, Jeff Carruthers. Um, so especially since then you know i've been performing a lot more with my band at first um i would perform with the band like with a really huge band because mm -hmm. um you know that record is inspired also a lot by tower of power so i did a lot of horn section work on there like i wrote all these horn sections and uh i played of course i played barry you know and tenor and alto and everything. And then I had a trombone player and a trumpet player. So we went and recorded all the horns. But at first, when I started uh, uh, performing with that band and, and to, to showcase that music, I had, at a time I had like 13 people in my band, not all at once at the same uh, on stage, but I had a drum, bass, guitar, keyboards, percussion, four horns besides me. And then uh, I had a uh, guest appearance by a steel drum player because somebody played steel drum. And then I had a couple of singers, like three singers that sang on one or two tunes. So, you know, it's mostly instrumental stuff, but I had like different people that I showcased in different, in different songs. Then, but through the years, um, you know, it's expensive to perform with that many people because, you know, you, even though they're your friends, in the band but you got to pay them so my band shrank <laughs> then it was uh just two horns and um no singers at all and then eventually like i started to perform just with a uh quartet backing me up like drum space guitar and keyboards and myself on sax so we had to do everything without the horn section which was fun too, because those tunes work as well without the horns. Right. And then um, when I, when you saw me opening up for Tower of Power, right. which was one of the highlights of my career, personal highlights, <laughs> it was just me by myself to tracks, which was kind of terrifying. Right. Because, you know, like, here is like a room full of, did you see me at the Savant Theater or the Rose? Which one did you It was at the Rose. It was at the Rose. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, it was terrifying because the some some footage of that video that you showed from the Rod Stewart uh, track mm -hmm. is from the second time me opening up for them at the Savant Theater. Uh, and, and the Savant is a little bit nicer of a room. It sounds better, and and it it's feels better than the rose is kind of a cave a little bit but you know when i met you there and this is the thing that i don't think people really understand how how things have changed in these days you get a a chance to open for tower of power which has this enormous fan base and people that show up that are just uh, really music people and then you get open but they don't pay you to play you gotta you gotta you know, guarantee that you're going to bring 20 guests to even get the gig. I was, oh, yeah. um, what it, 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 you have to pay. So, so basically how that worked is like, um, they, they make you sell the tickets and collect the money in advance. So basically what I had to do, I had to kind of like uh, ask all my friends, hey, do you wanna you wanna come see me open up for Tower of Power? You know, I got discount tickets. Um, and if people said yes, then I had to meet with them in advance and collect the money from them because those, you know, the whole Rose Theater, all the um, Canyon Club, right? It's the Rose, the Canyon Club, um, Saban, they're all together. Right. Um, they won't even let you do sound check unless I paid them the cash for all the tickets that I sold. No, it's crazy. It's really crazy. 
So oh. of course, you know, I, I did it. I did it the first time, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, this is exciting. And um, thankfully, I got enough people that came and bought the tickets. Then, and I, I was like, I don't want to do this again. This is like this is like super stressful for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I thought it was a great fit, and all the Tower of Power guys were super. Uh, supportive and they were all oh, yeah you sound great you know this is like because musically it's it's kind of along the lines of what they do especially with all the tracks and the and the horn section stuff behind it so then a couple of months later um the saban actually contacted me um because tower of power playing at the, at the saban theater and they were like well you know we need an opening act would you do it again and i said i would love to but i i don't know if i can I can manage to sell those tickets again because, you know, I, I'm not a salesperson. I, I don't want to go on Facebook and say, hey, guys, you know, here, come and see me play and buy tickets. You know, it's just not who I am. So um, and I were like, well, you know, do what you can. And I said, OK, so I, I ended up selling, you know, enough tickets anyway because I posted it and people were like, I guess people are more interested in the Saban because it's in Hollywood or Beverly Hills. You right. know, it's cooler. It's kind of hipper. It's not like, you know, freaking Pasadena. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, so that's why I didn't continue or pursue um, getting more opening gigs there at those theaters because it's stressful you know I, I i have enough stress in my life as it is and i don't i don't want to be like oh my god you know i still need to sell like a couple of tickets yeah you know for from a musician standpoint the overall scheme of things it doesn't really seem like it would be something that would add to what you're doing uh you almost can get the same amount of exposure network from uh, playing a, a club or like the baked potato and, or something instead of doing that. And, and it does seem to be uh, stressful other, other than the fact that you uh, can be billed on the same, uh, same billing as tower of power. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on, on that first, the song that I played as we uh, opened the show, was that off of your new album? No, no, that was not. That was of my second album called Horn Star, which is uh, which is a project that actually started with the idea of that title. Um, or they hear what they want to hear, you know. So I have to have you have to keep telling people. No, it's Horn Star, not what? the other <laughs> with an H. <laughs> it's with an age exactly right. so i had the idea what is it? i want to make a record that's that i can call horn star but i i figured i need something a little bit more edgy than like a jazz or whatever kind of a record so i i came up with the idea of making like a house music record yeah that came out, and that one came out in 2010 but there's another video, which if, if, I don't know if you want to show another video, yeah. which is actually my favorite video. It's Walking the Dog. It's also on my website. I think it's a second video. Okay. Um, Walking the Dog from the album Never Stand Still. And that's that's from that album, from that latest one that I released in Okay, so I've got, I'm at your website. I've got the live trailer. Uh, uh, and then... Uh, the Rod Stewart, uh, live at the Sunset Marquee. Um, Walking the Dog should be the second video up there. Is it mm, not? Uh, the, the, the one that I have, the second video is uh, 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 Rod Stewart. Huh. Uh, is it on YouTube? Yeah, it is. Just put in Walk In walk in uh, somebody's calling it. I, I, gotta, if, I normally take phone calls but i haven't put my phone number up there so <laughs> oh, okay 
So yeah, put in just just go to YouTube and put in walk in the dog, walk in with an apostrophe and my name, and it should come up right away. Okay. And then in, while I'm doing that, uh, tell me a little bit about um, the the things that I see on your page about uh, Mary J. Blige and uh, and Jeff Goldblum and some of those things that you were doing as well. Oh yeah, Jeff Goldblum, that's also a cool story. He, he was one of the ones that I met like very early on, I believe like in 90, 98 or 99, because I moved here in 97. And remember earlier on, I was talking about how I would go out with me at my saxophone and just go and ask people um, if I could sit in. So, and I heard that Jeff Goldblum um, had a jazz band and that he would, um, <clears throat> um, that he would uh, have people sit in. So I went there, I did the same thing. I walked up to him um, in a break and I said, hey, I just moved here, can I sit in? And um, yeah, so I ended up sitting in with them and then I, uh, they, they, they liked me. So they, they had a steady gig, like a weekly gig back in the days, like every week, uh, I believe it was every Monday or Tuesday, I'm not sure. So I ended up going there for like years, like every every week and sit in with them. Wow. So that was kind of fun. And then Mary J. Blige, I, I did a, um, was it Dancing with the Stars? I think it might have been, I'm not sure. I think it was Dancing with the Stars. I performed with her there. Do you know the greatest thing that I've done also was to perform with Lady Gaga at the Grammys oh. in 2016. Oh, how was that? That was super cool. That was the year David Bowie died. Oh. And when Lady Gaga did the, I don't know if you saw it, when Lady Gaga did the tribute to, to David Bowie, which was like super technically involved. Right. We yeah. actually rehearsed for that performance for like two weeks in advance, like every day. Really? Yeah, and uh, but that was cool, you know. Now Rogers was was the MD and yeah. super nice guy, and Rafael Sadiq played bass. So uh, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, now you went from this this uh, this woman in in uh, Germany or young lady going, I want to uh, someday be. Uh, play and perform with Star, you do Rod Stewart, you find yourself performing on the Grammys with Lady Gaga. And I'm thinking, wow. I, I, mean, I mean, what what was it feeling like when you were, did you ever have a moment when you were sitting there? Or, uh, it, sometimes uh, I don't feel something until after the fact, but, mm -hmm. but while you were there on the stage, did you have any kind of like, wow, I'm actually here with Lady Gaga. I, I mean, of course, yeah, of course. What? I mean, you know, there was a moment when she was like out front with like Nile Rodgers, Nile Rodgers was playing a solo and Rafael Sadiq was like standing and they were rocking out and I was like, oh my God, this is super cool. Right. Unfortunately, um, there is not very good footage where you can actually see me because um, the horns, uh, you know, it was four horns. I actually played Barry Sachs on that. Really? Yeah, I played Barry Sachs on that. And then uh, it was four horns and four strings. But we were in the dark comp the whole time. So if you watch the video of the performance, there's, I think, a couple of moments where you can kind of like see my, see, oh yeah, that could be her. <laughs> right. But unfortunately, you know, there's not, not any footage where you can really see us. Yeah, a lot of the the backup, the strings and horns and some of those backup singers and stuff are always in the dark and you can't really see them just with the, it it, it looks good having the bodies on the TV, but they, ne they never, the camera never points to them. It'll, the camera always points at the star. But I have Wog the Dog ready to go. You want to want to uh, walk, walk sure. in? This is actually, I absolutely love this video. It's you have to kind of like take a close look to the dog, to, to the guy in the dog suit. It's really, it's hilarious. I love this movie. Uh, this movie. Oh. <laughs> it's not a movie. It's a BD, video. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's going to give me a second to get this uh, queued up here. My screen on you. You will see me go black again. And okay. I'll share this. Okay, come on. Here we go. Here we go. And 
there.
Oh man. Okay. I got, <laughs> I don't know if you could hear me laughing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so two, two things I got to say. So I'm watching it. First of all, your, your, uh, berry, the tone on your berry is great. Thank you. I, I, sounds really good. But the drummer looks like Sammy Hagar. <laughs> <laughs> and the oh. keyboard player looks like, uh, um uh woody allen <laughs> woody allen yeah right that and then who okay so you've got a real dog but who's the guy in the dog suit that's my bass player andreas geck <laughs> he, he's the one playing bass also but he's also the guy in the dog suit we actually you know we had hired somebody that was gonna be in the dog suit um but the guy was just so not funny. Oh. He just didn't pull it off. It was like, you gotta be, you gotta be funny. And he was just not funny at all. So we were like, what are we gonna do now? So then Andreas was like, I'll do it. <laughs> right? Well, well, he's hysterical, especially. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what he was doing behind. I think it was the, the trumpet player or bone player. <laughs> oh, he, of course, he's, there. he's humping him. <laughs> Oh my God, I, I was dying. And then and then he, he, he raised his leg to pee on you while you were playing. I'm like, come on. <laughs> that was pretty funny. All right, so um, uh, I, I have to uh, do this because um, uh, I was telling you ahead of time, you know, Tom Pollitzer and I have been friends for a while. And, um, and everybody I've interviewed, I. I swear, almost everybody I've interviewed, I can't, except for maybe Daryl Walker last night, has a picture of Tom with them. It's almost like he's he's unintentionally photobombing all of my guests. So, and, and you didn't know this, that you had this picture, but I'm going to... I forgot. Yeah, I forgot about it. Uh, but here is a picture of you with my buddy Tom from Tower of Power at the NAM show. And who's the other lady you're with it? She looks like she's holding a, a berry. Do you uh, remember? I don't know, let me, can I see the picture? Uh, only if you log into my Facebook page and, and see what I'm showing. Okay, let me um, see. Um, let me see if I can do that real quick. <clears throat> uh, and there's a bit of a delay, but, but, uh, but it's there. So, um, uh and you you said you this was maybe uh last year do you did you go to nam this year hold on one sec who is that i don't know actually you, i honestly don't know who that is well you Sorry. know it, it could be somebody you're standing there with tom and somebody walks by and goes hey i want to be i want to get in this picture maybe it was a photo bomb might have been <laughs> Maybe it was you and her and Tom photobombed you guys. <laughs> That's your wishful thinking uh, about your theory of him photobombing all of your guests. Right. I, you know, I, and I have to give him a bad time about it because, you know, Tom and I go, go back a ways. So, um, so what your, your um, this new uh, CD that you did, uh, is it, can people get it on iTunes or can they get it? Uh, where can they, listen to the music oh the other oh, one from rock and the dog yeah 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 everywhere yeah okay me, yeah let me see if you spelt my i'm just here to see if you spelt my um yeah, yeah it did spell my my name right in the link yeah you, uh, it's it's everywhere it's on itunes uh cd baby all the you know i see so i also put your um, your uh, website address up uh, underneath you right now, katyareikerman.com. Okay. Yeah. So can, I can, um, um, well, I know that nothing's really happening at the baked potato right now. Um, but do you, I think not long ago you were, you either played there or were scheduled to play there. Is that correct? Uh, well, Baked potato. I don't know. Everything is a blur right now. I mean, yeah. Does I it? Don't know. I, I don't even know what day it is. And I almost, uh, as I said before, I almost missed our appointment because I, right. <laughs> I thought it was only two. And 
we then I was like, I looked at the watch and I'm like, oh my God, oh, it's like 10 to three. And I was on, on my, I was actually wearing a bikini on my, on my patty. I was like, I gotta throw on a shirt real quick. <laughs> <could have done. laughs> some, lip, some lipstick. And then I ran down here. So I don't, at the bank container, was I supposed to play there? Might have been, I'm not sure, but I, I had a bunch. I had a lot of gigs scheduled, like, um, like I was supposed to be in Chicago and then Florida and then Seattle for a bunch of gigs with yeah. with different artists. Yeah. Um, but of course, everything got, got canceled. You know. You know, uh, in in a way, this almost is like being on on no. It, it's not a good analogy saying it's like being on the road, but but I kind of feel as unsettled and checked out just being at home now through all of this as I did doing road gigs here and there only because nothing is so, nothing is normal. Everything is so out of normal. It almost feels like, um, like on a Christmas day when, you know, nothing's open and yeah. you, you can't wait till the, you know, it kind of feels like that, but it's ongoing. It, and yeah. I kind of lost sense of time and day. So what yeah. we need, what, been crazy. Oh, let me see. I, I'm sorry to in, interrupt you, but I've seen you do a couple of live streams from your from your house there. How's that been going? Uh it kind of like keeps me keeps me busy, you know, it's it's fun. Um I did a bunch, I haven't done any in a, in about a week, I think now. I, I'm hmm. thinking of putting one tomorrow again. Um, I know a lot of people that do it, they kind of schedule it like ahead of time or they do like a regular weekly thing or like you, you know, you do like every day, three, three and eight. For me, yeah. it's, it's kind of hard to commit to that because sometimes I'll wake up and I feel down and depressed and I don't want to be seen by anybody. And, yeah. you know, other days where I wake up and I'm like, oh, yeah, I need something to do. So then I decide I'm going to do this, to, you know, to, to get myself entertained and also, of course, to entertain everybody else. But yeah. it's also for my own entertainment and from, for myself to have a goal. Because, you know, when you do it, I usually make, make a decision like maybe a day before. I'm thinking of doing one tomorrow, uh, like around happy hour time, like maybe five o'clock or so. Yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking of doing it from my uh, actually album page because uh, just to, to change it up because you know I'm, I'm already at, at my limit at friends on my regular page oh. so I'm thinking of doing one tomorrow for the first time for my album page see how that goes mm -hmm. um, yeah so I'm doing those <clears throat> uh, put up a little you know virtual tip jar for people to tip um, you know that's it's not, of course, not mandatory. I know everybody does that these days because, you know, none of us has any income right now. Oh, I, you but know, you talked about that yesterday. Um, yeah. And it's, 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 let's not even get into that. <laughs> let's yeah. start, start I, about that. I, 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 I'm just going to say I have a daily struggle with forcing myself to stay positive. And, yeah. and you know, I'm, I'm not alone. I mean, I can, I can. But when when our gigs and that was one of the things that I, I do mention, you know, we we are um, what this has done is it has sort of brought some national attention a little bit to the gigging uh, person or the gigging industry or the gigging musician like us that make our living by playing music and that's just sort of disappeared. So we're all trying to find new ways of inventing uh, uh, ourselves. And I think, uh, that doing what you're doing and doing a virtual tip jar, almost every musician has started doing that and they should, because music in that one of the things, even though it was depressing <laughs> talking with Jamie, uh, yesterday is he said, you know, we we spend years at our craft and it's not free. You know, people shouldn't expect to get music for free like they think it's free. So uh, I think that it's a good thing that musicians are doing that and doing the virtual tip jar. And and uh, Daryl Walker last night said he's doing a, a Facebook thing where you have to pay to view it. And I don't know how they're setting that. It's like a concert thing, but that's something that people I think might start doing too. And if this carries on, 
too much longer, you know, I think more people will maybe resort to that. You know? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a long time until we start working again. Yeah. Because music is going to be the last thing that the last thing on the list, live concerts, that's going to be the last because it's not necessary. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think some of us might have to look for different ways in, in general to survive, you know, and to keep ourselves busy too. Right. You know, even if we end up, if we end up getting help from the government, you know, which, I mean, I, I applied for a couple of relief funds. Um, I got approved uh by musicians foundation a one-time payment of 200 dollars <laughs> so that's you know what am i going to do with that you know i go shopping i go shopping for like two weeks right. uh, with that and then then what what am i going to do then so so you know this right. is all we, we all still got to figure out what to do by the way right. um, i may mention this um I wrote a book, and if anybody wants to buy my book, you can go to my website. It's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, called One Hundred and One Soulful Fun Clicks, and it's a com combination of super cool, um, mostly easy uh, soulful fun clicks. Nice. Okay. Well, that's see, that's good. If 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 we can get that information, and if we can get just two or three or four people to get to your website based on doing this, then I've done my job at least. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. It's, uh, you know, uh, just only please, please only get it from my website. Right. Um, right. So, and it's, it's going to be a digital, digital download basically. So once you pay me, uh, I'll sell it for, I'm selling it for $15. Okay. Once you, uh, pay me using PayPal or whatever, I'll, send you the digital copy as a pdf and an email oh fantastic so uh we're we're at an hour, a little over an hour can you believe we've actually talked for an hour well we, we had a couple of video breaks so that's good well <laughs> you know yeah you know a couple of video breaks go you know go go get go to the restroom or something but no that was that was fun and you know i've learned a lot about you just in this conversation and that was the whole idea of calling it in the green room is because if we were doing a gig and we were sitting and talking getting ready to go out i would be asking all these same questions yeah. you know wanting to know about you so uh i'm glad that you said yes because i do feel like i got to know a little bit more about you and uh um you you know uh, I, like I said, I was sort of, I sort of had to feel, stop feeling like I was such a fan after I, I read all the things that you do. <laughs> like, and so, I mean, even my buddy, Tom, you know, it's, it's hard for me to go like, geez, yeah, I know you're my buddy, but dude, you're in tower of power, you know? know. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for joining me. I'm going to take us out with this song that we started with because it's a cool, it seems to really fit the uh, oh thank you so much yeah all right so um thank you uh katya and uh i will talk to you again soon thank you so much for having me and have a wonderful rest of your day okay bye right. bye everybody bye. Bye.